Uh, good morning. We're going to move to our next uh, panel discussion regarding uh, the Teva case. My name is Bob Surrett from McAndrews Heldon Malloy. I have uh, the panel up here this, evening, this afternoon. Uh, to my furthest left, Professor Melissa Wasserman from University of Illinois uh, College of Law. In the middle here, we've got William Jay from Goodwin Proctor, who was counsel for Teva. And to my immediate left, uh, Professor Greg Riley uh, from California Western School of Law. In a 7-2 decision written by Justice Breyer vacating the Federal Circuit's decision, the Supreme Court held that when reviewing a district court's resolution of subsidiary factual matters made in the course of construing patent claims, the Federal Circuit must apply a clear error standard of review as Federal of Civil Procedure 52A6 requires and not a de novo standard of review as the Federal Circuit had applied previously. So you know, we'll, just, we'll just jump right into it. And the first question I have is, is the Supreme Court's division between facts underlying claim construction and the construction itself worth the trouble of going through? So I, I think it could be worth the trouble of going through. Um, I, I think part of the confusion in claim construction is how much we value or how much we rely on the, the context of what a term generally means in, in a technical field versus how much we rely on uh, what the term, how the term is being used in the patent. And by separating out this, this question of the subsidiary fact finding, I think that helps focus us a little more on these kind of two distinct questions. The problem, I think, is that the case law is utterly confused as to what the relative weight is between how the term, what the term generally means in the field versus, if to the extent there is such a meaning, versus how it's being used in the patent. So, I think it's useful to kind of highlight that distinction, and I think the, the, the decision actually could do that. What the answer is to that question, how you balance those two, I think is very difficult and it is worth a uh, larger focus. Willie? Well, I, I think that the, uh, the basic point that we tried to make to the Supreme Court is that the judge is doing claim construction. You know, they're not you know, biomedical engineers. They are not, you know, computer computer programmers. They don't have the, the necessary familiarity with all of the lingo. Uh, and how are they, and yet they're supposed to read this document as if they were a person of skill in the art, you know, which in the Teva case itself would mean a PhD and experience in polymer synthesis. How do you do that? You need evidence. And there are cases where you don't, you really don't need any of that either because the skilled artisan's perspective isn't important or because what really matters is something legal, like a definition that's been written into the patent. Uh, and the judge's, the judge's first job is to distinguish between what's fact and what's law, and judges are good at that, and they do that in contract cases and you know, property cases and, and the like all the time. Once they find factual issues, then they're not supposed to be resolving them themselves without the benefit of evidence. And Going through that exercise might seem, a, you know, to add a layer of complexity. And this, you know, Justice Alito asked the same question mm -hmm. at the uh, uh, at the argument. It said, "Is the game worth the candle?" I'm holding here an article that says I can't find any cases where it would matter. And, and my answer to that is that's because those cases flew beneath the radar for so long. The skilled artisan's perspective essentially got lost, and the Federal Circuit got out of the business of separating the cases where it mattered from the cases where it didn't. And I hope that well now. Now we will see that separation start to emerge again. Melissa? Yeah, I'm, I think I, I tend to agree with that, uh, what William had just said. I think it's important. Um, I, I mean, I think part, because do I have a lot of feedback? Um, I think um, understanding, I think it depends in part on what your view is. Do you think the Federal Circuit's going to do a better job of clean construction or can the district court, right, um, with respect to the evidence in front of them? And I tend to think that we should be giving a little bit more deference to the district court's uh, construction. I don't think there's a huge issue um, for the courts to uh, distinguish between questions of law and questions of fact. They do it all the time. And yes, sometimes I think it can be hairy. But it's not so clear to me that that, in and of itself, should be a reason uh, not to move forward. But in light of the, the Federal Circuit law that the Supreme Court did not touch, like Phillips and Markman, and some of the recent decisions that have come down since the Teva decision, 
do you, do you really see this shifting the balance from the Federal Circuit to the district courts much it, or not? Yeah, so I don't know if it's going to end up making that big of a difference, right? Because they're clear in the case that um, the intrinsic evidence still rules, right? It's only going to be when you have in extrinsic evidence that's important, right, that, that you would see a sort of shift in the balance. And, you know, part of it's also going to depend on how the Federal Circuit applies it, right? Even when Teva got kicked back, they um, gave deference to the factual determinations and then, um, you know, essentially held the same, that they, the same way that they had. Um, they had before. Um, so it's not clear to me how much of a big sort of sea change it will make, but I do think it, it can make a difference on, on certain cases, right, where um, there is um, extrinsic evidence and, and um, um, factual issues are, are at play. But how many of those there is going to be under the big broad of all the claim construction cases that come up, I think it's probably going to be a small number. Yeah, Markman itself and Lighting Ballast, the Federal Circuit's most recent en banc on this issue, both featured people trying to make as much factual as possible. And right? basically the idea that if I am a guy, I bring in a guy and the guy says I'm an expert document reader and I'm going to read this document, I'm going to tell you what it means, and now it's a factual question. And that wasn't what Teva argued to the Supreme Court. It's not what the Supreme Court held. It's not going to be the law going forward. If that were the law, then like that obviously would make a big, big difference. Everything would be factual. Everything would be entitled to deference. You know, and uh, the Federal Circuit would have to think of new ways to uh, to review de novo. Here, you know, as the remand decision in Teva itself demonstrates, they all they have to do is call it legal, and they don't have to defer. Uh, so there were three findings that, the, that Teva litigated up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, one of them's factual. We're not going to tell you whether the other two are factual or legal. Go back and think about it. And surprisingly enough, the Federal Circuit said, albeit by a divided vote, both of those are legal. And so we're going to come to the same conclusion. The, uh, uh, the fact law line is, is, is really what's going to make the difference in whether this decision makes a difference at all. And you know, I was at a conference not that long ago with Judge Dyke. And someone asked Judge Dyke, you know, it, you know if, you're, if you guys continue on the path that you seem to be on, then it might not make much difference at all, right? And he said, that's right. It didn't seem to bother him. <laughs> Greg, you have any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I, I would generally agree. I mean, even the Supreme Court, in its opinion, I think hedges on how important it's going to be. At some places, it seems to suggest that uh, a case that turns on these underlying evidentiary questions is going to be the rare case. At other places, it seems to suggest that that's the normal uh, the normal starting point are these evidentiary underpinnings. So I think a lot goes to how this is going to play out in terms of incentives for the litigants um, to to start using experts even more in, in uh, claim construction. The district court judges, do, I mean, do they care so much about getting deference that they are going to rely more on say expert evidence, even though it might increase their effort and cost? And then the federal circuit, um, to, to, the more the federal circuit kind of uh, prioritizes the intrinsic evidence, which it seems to be doing, um, that'll undercut the decision. So I, I, I think, I, I tend to think the decision is less significant than a lot of the patent community seem to think it was right after the decision. Um, but I think a lot depends on how it is. So let's talk about the impact to litigants. What, you know, how do you think litigants will use this decision uh, moving forward to, in, in their cases? You know, nobody knows in advance whether they're going to win or lose in the court, right? Nobody knows in advance whether they're going to want the district court to get flipped or deferred <laughs> to, right? And so nobody knows in advance whether it's going to be to your advantage to make it a legal issue about the intrinsic evidence or, a, or a, an issue about the extrinsic evidence. Uh, I, you know, I think it, it's going to be technology-specific, case-specific, and you have to think about the litigation context as well, because you know, if you, for example, in you know the Teva case was a pharmaceutical uh, brand versus generic case. You know those cases uh, when they're dealing with patents listed in the Orange Book, uh, they have to get through trial and resolved within 30 months. Like you know, because if you are the brand, you want to keep the generic off the market, and your stay expires after 30 months. So uh, if if bringing in experts for claim construction is going to materially lengthen the time of the litigation. Mm -hmm. You know, you may have independent reasons not to want to do that, uh, that that don't go to whether you're going to win the claim construction. Melissa, what do you think? 
Um, so I was actually at a, a conference last week where there were a number of judges from the Eastern uh, uh, District of Texas and the Northern District of Texas, and they were asked, yeah, have you seen any sort of differences? And are litigants putting more um, um, intrinsic evidence in? And they actually said no. Um, and so a couple of these probably represented maybe about 20 to 25 percent, I think, of the patent filings. Um, so I don't know if it's a time delay, but it was interesting because I would have thought, you know, there would have at least been some more incentive to, to increase that evidence. Did they say anything about their own willingness to entertain it? Because, because that, that's relevant too. Yeah. So they didn't. Ne no. Mm -hmm. I, so they didn't necessarily say anything about their own willingness to entertain it. Although they did say they did they did admit it, that they perhaps would be couching more things as factual, you know, moving in. in in the future, but they didn't. They, what they did say was they had noticed a substantial change in what litigate, the evidence that litigants were putting putting forth. I mean, I can give you one data point, which is that Judge Sleet in Delaware, who's you know a very experienced patent judge in a very 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 busy patent district and one of the very few judges, um, his practice for years has been if you put in expert declarations with your claim construction submission, they will be stricken from the docket before the sun sets. You know, like he doesn't, he did not want. Them. So he won't even entertain. He would not entertain them. But now, he is. Uh, you know, in at least one case that I'm aware of, he has said, "I've read the party's claim construction submissions. I think this is hard. I think that we should have expert evidence on this. You know, we may we may combine that with the bench trial. <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, so not so slowing the process down, but yet, yeah, but it, it absolutely could be judge specific. I think the one thing. Um, that, that kind of looms in the background here when we talk about the impact is the extreme concentration of patent cases. 30% uh, of patent cases last year and 44% uh, in the first half of uh, this year were filed in the Eastern District of Texas. And if patentees perceive themselves as having better chances in the Eastern District of Texas than at the Federal Circuit, um, which I think there, there could be good reason to do so, they might perceive themselves to be more likely to be on the winning side uh, uh, in the district court and therefore more likely to rely on evidence. But it's interesting to hear that the judges are saying that they're not, uh, they're not seeing that yet. So do we anticipate a, a drop in the reversal rate How do we, in, in claim construction? Do we anticipate any significant impact? So, uh, you know, I think it's hard because um, one thing, if you're just tracking what the reversal rate is over time, right, that's sort of assuming the underlying cases that are getting appealed are staying the same, right? And so it could be that after this comes in, litigants are choosing to appeal a sort of different subgroup. So even if we sort of see changes in the leniency or, or how likely you are to be upheld, the reversal rate may not demonstrate it. The other thing, though, I think is, um, you know, interesting is, yeah, I mean, to the extent you are getting deference or getting more deference, yes, you would expect that at some level to affect what, what your likelihood of, of, of being upheld. But I also think that the, it's important to have the overlay of um, a lot of people think after Phillips that the Federal Circuit began to give sort of more informal deference or, or some more deference. Um, and again, what I thought was interesting with these judges last week, that was their impression. Um, and they seem to think that Teva was um, just sort of catching up with what was already occurring by the Fed Circuit. Again, this was only like two or three judges, so I'm not sure. You know, it's a it's a limited view, but it um, it is a question of um, you know, is this actually going to affect how the Federal Circuit approaches cases? Yeah, and the uh, there was amicus briefing in the Supreme Court uh, led by Professor Peter Manel about uh, kind of the empirics of this. You know, is the reversal rate really coming down? Uh, you know, can you control for some of these external factors? And you know, they concluded that there had been some decrease and you know some layer of informal deference, but not as much as the just sort of brute force raw numbers would suggest. You know, fewer claims are are, are being construed in district court. You know, there are you know, fewer claim construction errors. How do you factor in all of these uh, summary affirmances uh, that it contain no reasoning and you have no idea whether the claim construction was right or wrong? You just learned that it didn't affect the Federal Circuit's view of the outcome. So uh, I think at least one Federal Circuit judge or, or retired judge has kind of said somewhere that, you know, informal deference means essentially uh, we think some judges are pretty good and other judges are not, and the judges that are good are going to get some deference. And, you know, I think you can fairly question whether that's an appropriate way to run a bill. <laughs>
I, I, you know, I, I question whether the uh, uh, reversal rate will come down, partially because of uh, some of uh, Professor Anderson and Manel's work. Uh, that, that, that you've already seen some informal deference. And then also, um, <coughs> uh, there's an empirical study by uh, Wagner and Petherbridge uh, that it was then updated after Phillips, showing that a significant portion of reversals have to deal with disagreement <coughs> as to the methodological approach of the, of the court, whether to start with uh, kind of a general meaning in the field and look for a clear disclaimer to disavow in the specification, or start more with the kind of intri uh, implicit definition in the in the specification, and Teva doesn't really affect that. Nor uh, would if the federal circuit is disagreeing with the approach to claim construction that the district court is taking, that wouldn't be something on which the district court would be So, you know, a lot of the commentary after Teva is focused on the litigation impact, but we foresee any prosecution impact in any way. So. I, I don't, the, the Federal Circuit has applied TEVA to uh, claim constructions issued in post-issuance proceedings uh, from the Patent Office, which may, I mean, although TEVA is based on uh, federal rules of procedure, it makes sense under the APA standards of factual review. Um, I, I, I tried to think through whether there's any kind of claim drafting um, implications uh, here, and it just seems so attenuated to, to think, oh, if I draft my claim this way, it'll be more likely to do this in the district court, which will be more likely to uh, uh, get deferential review. Uh, my background's in patent litigation, so perhaps I'm not uh, thinking as sophisticatedly as a patent prosecutor <laughs> about these issues. But it's hard for me to see anything uh, really, any real impact on the original. Well, yeah, I think you have to think about what is the baseline against which this is going to be read, and you know what what are, what assumptions are we making about what things mean, and if those are going to be open not just to litigation but to uh, kind of battle of the experts type litigation. You know, uh, there might be some additional incentive to define more terms. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe at the margin some incentive to to try to define more terms, but I think it goes back to the point um, that was made earlier. It's you don't know which way the district court's going to come out, so it's not so clear you want to make it more factual or not. Right, and, and you know, you, you you want the if you want the claim to be as broad as possible, but not if uh, pose a validity problem. You know, sometimes uh, uh, you can ward off an indefiniteness issue by defining more things but then you're surrendering what you might otherwise be claiming just because words are, words are limited to what they can capture. So the, the majority opinion in Justice Thomas had a disagreement as to whether a patent's more like a contract or a statute or legislative history. And what's your view and, and what impact, if any, does that view, should that view have? Well, you know my view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so I think it's an interesting question because it's sort of, to me, I think of it, is this more like public law or private law, right? And and patents are unusual, and a lot of the sort of agencies that make these sort of entitlement or licensing decisions, whatever they decide doesn't have as much of an impact on third parties, right, as patents do. So they're clearly this sort of public aspect um, to making a validity determination, right, of whether a patent is valid or not. Um, and so it, it is, in some ways, sui generis. It's sort of a mix. Um, so even though I think patent law has these sort of very public aspects, I was sort of uncomfortable with interpreting it um, as a statute, right, which meant there was no words. I think there's lots of sort of differences between thinking of a, an examiner who is uh, um, usually making a determination about whether a patent should be issued or not and what goes into um, passing a, a legal statute. So. So I actually, I tend to agree with Melissa that I, I tend generally to be anti-patent exceptionalism in, in favor of kind of bringing it in line in, in the analogies to other areas of law. Uh, but here it just doesn't seem like either are particularly good analogies. Um, uh, and I think it, it's both in terms of the process in that um, in, in both statutes and contracts, it's largely a compromise. It's uh, either a compromise among legislators or a compromise among two competing parties, and you have forces pushing in either direction. The specification is drafted solely by a single party, 
Um, and the claims, yeah, sure, there's some negotiation there, but the examiner just simply doesn't have the interest to push back to the level that competing legislators do or competing contracting parties. And then I think it's also the form of the document. I mean, what we have is we're interpreting patent claims, but they come accompanied by a five to 45 page explanation of the context of what's going on here, of, of, of all this information with which we can use to interpret the claims. It would be as if you had contracts that had you know, 10, 15 pages of whereas clauses giving background on the contract, and, or you had a lot of enacted uh, uh, legislative history. So I think in both of those regards, um, there's not a great analogy. Actually, I mean, this is getting out there, but uh, regulatory interpretation, where you're interpreting, interpreting regulations that are promulgated by an agency with some pushback from the public, and that come accompanied with a preamble might be a better analogy, but we just don't have a lot of uh, doctrine development. But I mean, let's think about like, wh why, why they were making the analogy, right? You know, because in interpreting statutes, Justice Thomas is coming at it from the proposition, you know, advanced by the respondents in the case. Statutes have to have one meaning, one, one, one meaning, one public meaning. Got to be the same nationwide. And so, uh, if we need facts to understand what a statute means, they have to be the same facts. They can't be subject to the whim of a particular fact finder sitting in one federal district court somewhere in the corner of the country. Uh, when we, the Supreme Court, you know, this is what the dissenters were saying, uh, interpret statutes, you know, we can kind of look at whatever facts we want, but we don't, we aren't bound by, uh, bound by a trial court's decision in the same way we would, we would be in a contract case. And you know the, the reason that I think the majority rejected that, and that we reject, uh, we Tevis lawyers pushed back on that, uh, were twofold. You know, number one, a patent doesn't absolutely, positively have to have the same meaning nationwide in all respects, uh, you know, in the same way that a statute does. Because a statute, I mean, a patent is not a rule of primary conduct that uh, you know certainly people take you know, organize their businesses around their understanding of patents, but it's not that, you know, patent infringement is not a crime, right? And, uh, you know, these problems can be solved through licensing and other private arrangements in a way that the correct interpretation of a statute can't be. Uh, that, and that's one point. And uh, the other point is just that, uh, you know, uniformity might be a good thing, but it's not a, it's not a reason to sort of iron facts out of um, out of the uh, out of the litigation you know just because you think that they're unhelpful there are certainly contracts that people enter into that are the exact same contract you know nationwide you know look at your cell phone subscriber agreement you know a lot of other people have signed the exact same agreement but at the same time uh, we don't take considerations of uh, industry usage or for that matter you know individual intent out of the contract litigation just for the sake of uniformity I'd like to return to the issue of, um, you know, the impact this might have on district courts and how they're treating it. You know, and, you know, I've heard certain district court judges and having clerked for a district court judge here in the Northern District, some, because of the high reversal rate at the Federal Circuit, that some, many feel that they're a collector of the record more than anything else in some instances. And do you see any significant change then how district courts are going to impact uh, or address uh, Markman in, in particular, tr making more subsidiary factual findings to protect their their rulings? You know, I, I, I wonder if it will encourage the Markman hearing to be even a larger uh, process than it is. Uh, you know, I think it varies from industry to industry and from lawyer to lawyer, but it seemed to me in recent years of post Phillips, there had been less and less usage of like the claim construction, construction discovery time uh, that you have in uh, built into most patent local rules. And it would seem to me that this will encourage parties to at least, you know, begin developing a, a larger evidentiary record, and also um, uh, might even begin to see, uh, you know, sometimes we have these, but more of these two to three day Markman hearings that are, are actually mini mini trials um, with expert witnesses. Uh, uh, again, you know, all if the district courts think it's worth the cost of doing so. There's the, here's my construction, and then there's the, here's why. And I think a lot of district judges have stinted on the, here's why, because they think the federal circuit doesn't care. And the, 
you know, the import of Teva is that there are some things you can say in the here's why section that could matter quite a bit. Yeah, and I do think it, it will depend in part on, um, yeah, if they think this sort of extra cost and extra time it takes, right, is worth it for them. So it may depend also on how heavy of a dockets they are. Or how interested they are in patent yeah. cases, that, too. You know, that, that if, you're, if they're really into patent cases, a three-day Markman hearing might be appealing. But uh, if they're just trying to get the patent case off their docket. <laughs> It's not. It's not just the hearing time. It's also the writing time. Yeah. Right. Right. You know that there's a limited amount of time between the hearing and the time when the construction is needed by the parties to actually go continue litigating the case. And writing a hundred-page scholarly Markman opinion that explains why you construe each term in particular ways would be very useful. But you know, sometimes it's beyond the, um, you know, beyond the capacities of the court just in terms of their workload. So I, I've never, I never quite, quite bought this argument that judges weren't explaining their Markman hearings because their Markman decisions because they were, they didn't think they'd get deference from the federal circuit. I mean, I, I, I think most claim construction orders tend to be fairly detailed, fairly long, as certainly as long as a, as a summary judgment order. Uh, and, and I think the, the short kind of like, cl basically claim chart approach with no explanation is the exception. Well, it's a pretty significant exception. You know, I mean, there there are enough judges that do it that way that that it's you know, in in patent heavy districts that it's not just something that nobody has to worry about. What are we seeing from the case law since Teva at the federal circuit in terms of how are they how are they treating the claim constructions? And you know, I my read of it is they're they want to just rely on intrinsic evidence. In some cases, they're just kind of brushing away factual findings saying it's not relevant. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah. And I know that's not a question on our yeah. list, but um, I figured you might have yeah, some thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I've seen, yeah, they seem to rely on intrinsic evidence. I think that, you know, the sort of how are they going to treat dictionary definitions was sort of an interesting aspect, right, that it doesn't look like that, I mean, that's not necessarily going to get, be a fact finding, right, um, which makes sense, I think. An, in, an English dictionary. Like an ordinary dictionary of the English language, yes. but that's right. Yes. Scientific dictionaries could different. be, yeah. But, you know, the, 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 that surfaced in a case that then wound up getting deleted on rehearing. Okay. Uh, you know, but but that that's a festering issue as well. Like what to do with a scientific dictionary? I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. Um, let's we'll re let's return to that when we're done. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, I think there's some interesting sort of questions out there to see what they're gonna. Because I think now the fight is right. Is what's going to be a factual finding, right? And I think Teva sets up a clear example, right? If you have a term and you have two party experts sort of arguing what it is, but then if we use dictionaries or other aspects, um, I think is, is still sort of up for the federal circuit to figure out. Um, you know whether whether that's going to count as a subsidiary factual finding. I think the other issue then that always is going to be with the Fed Circuit is how much they think they can decide just on the intrinsic evidence versus even having to look at the extrinsic evidence. Right. I mean, the, the, the Phillips hierarchy and, yeah. and, and what, what role it's going to play, I think, is the, is the most significant question going forward. Because what happens when um, the, specific, the, specific, the claim is ambiguous and one party says the specification resolves the ambiguity this way, because a skilled artisan reading the specification would understand, you know, in, Te in Teva, for example, it was the use of particular technology in the specification. Well, that tells you there must be this measurement. And the other side says, no, that doesn't tell you that at all. Uh, is that using the intrinsic evidence, right? We're just talking about the specification. Or is it using extrinsic evidence because we're talking about how a skilled artisan would understand the specification? Uh, and, you know, I would submit that it's the latter, but uh, there are certain panels in the Federal Circuit that say, I can answer this question using only the intrinsic record. And because I can answer it using the, only the intrinsic record, the extrinsic evidence is irrelevant. I will disregard the factual findings relying on the extrinsic evidence, even though it's based on, you know, uh, based on expert evidence and the district court actually made a factual finding. That, I think, is the most sort of uh, the area in which the Federal Circuit could easily uh, you know, sort of sail into another, you know, line of error. Uh, so I think part of the problem in evaluating how the Federal Circuit is applying it is that the cases, the, the cases that the Federal Circuit's getting. So certainly in the early cases, it was emphasizing intrinsic evidence post-Teva. But it's, I mean, it's hard because 
the, the cases weren't necessarily, now everyone's certainly trying to rephrase their cases depending on extrinsic evidence, but that's not necessarily how they were litigated. You know, there might have been paper declarations as opposed to live expert testimony. Teva had, um, Teva had paper declarations. Right, right. Uh, okay, fair enough. Um, uh, but that, I think, doesn't, I, I think it's easier to dismiss fact findings based on paper declarations than on live expert the Supreme Court and Rule 52 both say you can't do that. Fair you know, enough. I'm not, it doesn't mean that they won't try. Right, right. I'm, saying, I'm saying just as an absolute practical matter by the Federal Circuit, yep. I think it's I think it's more more um, uh, that they would be more inclined to to defer to live expert testimony than paper written declarations, regardless of what the actual rule is. Yep. Um, so I think a lot depends. Goes back to this question of what are the cases going to begin to look like as they come up to the Federal Circuit, uh, and how is that going to change, um, if at all? And, and so let's return to this question of the, the impact on how litigants will strategize. If you take Willie's, I think he's the first one that made the point, I think both, both of you echoed it, you don't know who's going to win or lose at the, at, at, at when you start your case, and certainly when you're at the Markman stage. And if you know that you can obtain a de novo review if you stick with the intrinsic evidence, is, it, is there in fact an incentive to just stick with the intrinsic evidence and, and kind of roll the dice? You get two shots that way, yeah. right? You get the district court and the, and the court of appeals. Uh, it reduces costs, um, so, so to some, it, it might depend on what's at stake. I mean, Teva looks very different than say a mechanical patent in a smaller industry. Um, on the flip side, I mean, I think, I think uh, uh, there's a general sense that patent litigation doesn't connect enough to the to the technology and to the, to the uh, uh, technical field and technical uh, 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 people. And I think that there's a sense that there's a need to, to bring that in more, and this is an opportunity to do so. So, I, you know, I. I, I I don't. I think it's going to vary from lawyer to lawyer, and lawyers have different strategies. I want to yes. just say something before I pass it. But then, does then that not have a nod towards revisiting Phillips, as opposed to dealing with Teva? Because you know, I think one of the things that I've always struggled with as a as a as a litigant is, you know, the standard is how one of skill and the art would interpret it at the time, and then you have Phillips saying the, the intrinsic evidence can answer that, and that that doesn't make any sense on a lot of different levels, and. I will tell you, when I was a district court clerk here, we had two Markman hearings. It was right after Markman came down, so it was 97, 98. I think we had two three-week-long Markman hearings. Yeah. And, and so I and it was testimony for weeks. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, I 100% agree with you. I yeah. think the real issue here, that, I mean, that's why, I, you know, I, I've said, actually, at the lighting ballast, when lighting ballast went in bank, that the, the Federal Circuit had chosen the wrong issue. That The standard of review can only be decided once we know what we're doing in claim construction. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the whole issue of, of revisiting Phillips, and in fact, you know, the, you've seen evidence uh, uh, in some of the Federal Circuit panel opinions of going back to more of the split that existed before Phillips as to the emphasis on uh, 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 how, how much of a role the specification is going to play versus kind of uh, extrinsic evidence. I think that's the, I mean, I think that's the real issue. That's, that's the important issue on which uh, claim construction turns. So, I mean, if, if you think of patent litigation as only being about litigating to a final judgment so that if somebody wins at the, at the very end, then yeah, you know, everybody might want kind of the insurance policy of a de novo appeal to the federal circuit. But, you know, many clients want certainty and they want it sooner, right? You know, they are making a business decision. You know, in the pharmaceutical, you know, context, for example, after the district court but before the appeal, that often is when is the time when a generic chooses whether it is going to go on the market and take the risk of damages liability or not. And the stickier the district court's construction, uh, the more likely they can predict the outcome and predictability is a good thing. And the same thing for settlement. You know, if you've gotten the claim construction and the claim construction means no more than a cocktail napkin, then it's not going to meaningfully inform your settlement uh, discussions. Uh, if it if it's more likely to be sticky, to, more likely to be the claim construction that is operative by the end of the case, then it is going to inform your settlement discussion. It might bring the parties closer together, more likely to resolve the case without you know the trial and the de novo appeal and maybe the retrial. 
this. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's one of the things I usually hear from when you talk to patent holders, right, is they want certainty, and, and especially in the pharma, with um, how, long, I mean, how long it takes them from the time that they have their compound to it sort of uh, goes through clinical trials. So I think it, 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 to the certainty aspect then, you know, it would seem, um, you know, this, you would have more, hopefully, with, with more deference. Well, does it really, does Teva provide that certainty? I think, you know, that's, I think, the question for me. Certainly not, certainly not complete certainty. It, it, not like, not the way Markman or, or the position taken in lighting ballast would have, you know, so that deference all the time, every time, uh, so that, it, you know, more like an abuse of discretion standard, so that the district courts are very likely, very unlikely to be upset. We don't have that, right? You know, all, all we have are, you know, some opportunities to have corners of the claim construction kind of walled off from review to some degree. So no, no, it, it definitely is not going to provide complete certainty, but um, at most incrementally greater certainty. If you, if you yeah, no, I agree with that. And I mean, I do think it goes back to how the federal circuit's going to be applying it in the future. So like the fact that they upheld Teva, for, or they kept the same decision that they had from Teva, to a certain extent, I'm like, they'd already decided it. If it's similar, you know, it's not that surprising to me that they didn't change it. But how much is this going to actually influence it if it's a new case where they haven't? they hadn't seen the, the particular facts and issues before, it may have more of an influence there. Very good. Very good. Well, let's shift uh, focus a little bit here. And so how does this decision fit more broadly with other patent cases in which the court has given the district court more deference, such as eBay, the case now dealing with uh, involving the grant of injunctions? So I, I think that's actually one of the, I mean, we look at a lot, try to find themes in the mm -hmm. Supreme Court's patent cases. And I think it's actually one of the more significant themes in the patent cases. You see three kind of um, uh, ways in which power is being shifted from the federal circuit to the district courts. One is standard of review. You see that in Teva and the Highmark case. Uh, two are standards that are explicitly based on kind of uh, a district court discretion like octane fitness. And then three are just kind of more open-ended standards as opposed to uh, 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 clearer rules that will just require district courts to consider uh, more things. And you see that in KSR. And so, I, you know, I, to try to get into the psychology of it, you know, a lot of people are unhappy with the federal circuit. They see it as too pro patentee, as um, uh, too uh, power aggrandizing, and, and that, those kinds of things. And so, it seems to me that the Supreme Court sees district courts as kind of a balance to the to the federal circuit. Um, the question again comes back to this fact: uh, uh, is the is the Supreme Court going to like what it gets? when 30 to 40% of cases are in a particular district because that district is seen as particularly favorable to patentees. If you think the federal circuit was pro-patentee, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's hard to argue that the Eastern District of Texas is not more pro-patentee than the, than the federal circuit. So, you know, without some sort of venue reform, I'm not sure that to the extent the Supreme Court is consciously um, trying to counterbalance the federal circuit, it's gonna succeed that much when we shift in power to the district. Really? So uh, Greg alluded to, I think, another of the very important themes, which is patent exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court hates it, doesn't believe in it, right? You know, especially where, as in Teva, you have a written rule, and the federal circuit, uh, you know, basically just has to apply the same rule that every other court of appeals does. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, dissent in the SCA hygiene en banc from you know a week or so ago, which we we'll can probably talk about this afternoon, in the case about latches. Judge Hughes has a dissent that says, essentially, we have to stop acting as though we can make up patent-specific rules. You know, here's a string site, you know, and eBay was one, Tevo was another. Um, you know, you, you could add many others going all the way back to, like, Dickinson versus Zerko, where they had to tell the federal circuit, you are an appellate court, the PTO is an agency, you apply the Administrative yeah. Procedure Act, and not, you know, not a patent-specific version of it. So that that's one thing. I think the other thing is, Claim construction is a mixed question of law and fact. There are other mixed questions of law, mixed questions of law and fact that the federal circuit, you know, from time to time has treated as if they were, you know, law and not mixed. And the the role that the facts play in those mixed questions is something that Teva can shed some light on. And you can see that from the fact that Teva cites obviousness cases like Denison from the mid '80s. You know, that say, you know, the facts are the grounding that the legal conclusion rests on, and you have to get the facts right, and the district court's job is to get the facts right, and your job is to see if they committed clear error. 
Yeah, no, I agree. That definitely a theme of patent exceptionalism, definitely the theme of, um, you know, the Federal Circuit likes bright line rules and the Supreme Court wants um, standards. And it's interesting, though, um, to see sort of more generally, I mean, it, it's the Federal Circuit tends to have decisions, right, that give themselves to Nova Review, that give less deference to whether it's the PTO or TTAB or, you know, uh, the district courts. And I think there is definitely a pushback. Um, against it, that the whole swath of things is, is leading to giving the district courts more more discretion. Interesting, though, I think from coming out of Congress, some of the reform acts those seem to cut the opposite way with some of the patent um, non-practicing entity reform and sort of limiting the discretion of district courts in what they can do. We're kind of getting towards the end of our time, so I thought that I'd open it up to the uh, audience for questions. There we go. So uh, appreciate your comments. A couple of things that I'd uh, be interested to hear your thoughts on. With respect to certainty, the uh, lighting ballast opinion, citing some of the amici who had, uh, who had briefed that case, and uh, in, in Teva, Professor Minnell and, and Professor Ryan Anderson's, their brief uh, sort of pointed this up as well. There's a difference between vertical certainty, which is are you going to get the same outcome on appeal that you got in the court below versus horizontal certainty right. as among the various district courts? Because greater deference is a greater tolerance for divergence and error, right, as among the various courts. So yeah. the technology specificity that William, you pointed to, I'd be curious to know what you all think is uh, uh, how that's going to play out with respect to people who sue in multiple courts and how they're going to fare on appeal. And then the second question, um, in terms of sort of framing things more in terms of facts that can be deferred to, sort of insulating yourself from review on appeal, um, if you do that, then conceivably we'd see a return, uh, you know, a, gray, a much greater use of vitronics. And the question of whether something is in fact fact dispositive is itself subject to de novo review. The underlying facts may be subject to to deference, but whether it is in fact dispositive is now de novo review. So you're back to, yeah, the underlying facts are fine, but what to make of them and what conclusions to draw for them, Federal Circuit still has a way to come back and, and give itself the authority that it thinks it wants. So I'll, I'll address your first question on the horizontal certainty. You know, I'm not actually that concerned about this idea of divergent district court opinions under, uh, under Teva, and that's because you have to think about it. If the patentee loses in the district court, the patentee is precluded, right? Uh, a non-mutual uh, issue preclusion. Uh, but if the patentee wins, they're not precluded. Or, I mean, sorry, the accused infringer is not precluded. But patentees who win like to refile in the same district. And because venue and personal jurisdiction are fairly broad, they normally can. So I, I'm not overly concerned that divergent district court opinions are going to appear more than in unusual. Well, that personal jurisdiction thing is changing. It, well, I mean, that's potentially right. With the, and the venue, with the, there's a venue is proposed, proposed in, the, in Congress. Yes, uh, you know, but but at the moment, there is still an MDL statute, right? And, and the, uh, unless you're talking about purely sequential litigation and, that is both at different times and in different districts, you can wind up before the same judge who's going to render the same claim. Even if you don't, as I think Justice Breyer pointed out, uh, quoting Markman, you know, judge number two can look at construction yeah. number one right. and find it instructive. And if and you know, if the second case has a better expert that provides better factual content and leads to different findings, that's not necessarily a bad outcome. Yeah, and and then I think there's also you know the Federal Circuit's reviewing it, and I think their instinct, right, is obviously going to be to try to harmonize the uh, claim construction. And if it means, you know, finding something more legal than factual, I, I think that that might also, they may also be doing that. You have the last question, because we're done. My, my question is not about claim construction, but about the parties to the case. One thing that's so interesting here is you have Teva, the largest generic manufacturer in the world, as the patent owner. You have Sandoz, but as the generic, as a subsidiary within Novartis, we see Pfizer acquiring generic yeah. division. We see in biosimilars, the sophistication there, bringing parties together. So I was wondering is whether you had thoughts on 
what this means for the way that patent law is going to develop. It seems to be that we have a scrambling of some traditional pro-patent, anti-patent sides, and we have vertically integrated companies that are on both sides of this issue. And what does this mean for the amicus briefs they file, the cases they choose to push, all of the Supreme Court patent strategy? That right. You said you saw absolute silence from pharma, from the generic pharma trade association, from the biotechnology industry organization in this case. You know, I think basically because you can be on either side of this issue, depending on whether, on whether you win or lose. The, group, the companies that filed and that the Federal Circuit gave great, great you know, weight to were the technology companies like Google and Intel. And they basically you know, were firmly of the view that, you know, probably because of the Eastern District of Texas problem, they want a de novo do-over, period. Uh, well, so, I mean, it's actually interesting. I hadn't really thought about that. But the, the more you see pharma getting split, um, because the generics tend, not always, but tend to line up more with uh, the, the Silicon Valley position, the Google position on things. And so the more- The defense see, position. The def yeah, defense position, if you will. Uh, the more you see uh, the pharma kind of splitting or not being as a uni united or unified uh, front, the uh, more power that will give to uh, what Willie likes to call the defense, the defense side of it, the, the kind of restricting of uh, patent, patent protection. And they'll, they'll have, they, you won't have as much of the counterweight well, wonderful. Thank you. When Ed ever, always asks me to do these, I always say yes, because I get to spend an hour talking to three very highly intelligent and wonderful people, and uh, that happened to be today as well. So thanks for your time, panel, and uh, thanks to the audience for your, uh, uh, your, your, uh, your listening.